There have been some absolutely astounding discoveries made about humanity's collective past over the previous two years or so, much of it done by satellite imaging, and in this video, we're going to explore two of them. Both of these are, eventually, going to get a dedicated video of their own, so think of this one as an introduction. Dealing with each of these sites is both fascinating to research and really fun to learn about, but also maddening because they're located on the peripheries of ancient societies that made heavy use of writing, and from which we have records surviving from antiquity. But these two sites are just out of reach, so all we have, really, is material evidence, and what archaeologists have been finding over the past two years is, and I'm not exaggerating here, simply mind-blowing. So, the first one on this video is a recent discovery in Europe that is, essentially, totally changing the state of our knowledge on the Bronze Age in that region, specifically in the Carpathian Basin. Up until the early 2020s, archaeologists who focused on the Middle Bronze Age in the Carpathian Basin, so approximately 2000 to approximately 1600 BC, knew two major things had occurred over those centuries. The first is that the archaeological record tells us that the use of bronze had become far more widespread than it had previously, and societies then shifted from utilizing bronze as a prestige or an elite good to employing it in more common utilitarian ways. And the second thing that is observed in the archaeological record is that most of the settlements were tell settlements meaning that the sites were occupied for generations and the people living there built and rebuilt on similar spots, leading to the creation of mounds, or tells. These tell settlements were extremely complex, they evidently had some sort of a hierarchy, and then, after about 1600 BC, in the archaeological record, they appear to have declined and basically been abandoned, and nobody was clear really on what, if anything, came next in the Carpathian Bronze Age. The standard picture is one of, well, basically total site abandonment and assumed population decline in the region post-1600 BC. Until now, that is. Located in Romania are the remains of a gigantic Bronze Age site, known as a megafort, called Cornesti Irchuri. It dates to between about 1500 and about 1000 BC, approximately, and this thing is massive. It can really only be seen properly from the air, because it occupies an area of about 17 and a half square kilometers. For a very long time, this was the only site of its kind that was known for certain. But, recent work published in December of 2023 has shown that this is no longer the case. In a region archaeologists are terming the Tisha Site Group, over 100 of these megaforts have been discovered dating to the period after 1600 BC. So, what that means, basically, is that contrary to previous thinking on the decline of the Middle Bronze Age tell settlements, the Carpathian Basin, or at least a portion of it, appears to have prospered and reorganized itself politically after 1600 BC. This site group occupies an area approximately 8,000 kilometers square, so about three times the size of Luxembourg. And the 100 or so identified sites range from 5 to 10 hectares to hundreds, with the biggest one being close to 2,000. Most of these appear to have been political centers ringed by smaller settlements that are presumed to be villages or small towns. The Tisha site group continued for about 300 years, until approximately 1300 BC, after which many of them began to decline, and the recent findings argue that, much like the Aegean and the Po Valley, the Lower Carpathian Basin was a major cultural and very likely probably a major political center during the late European Bronze Age. A major factor in helping to kick this off, at least to a degree, appears to have been climate change. Drawing on data derived from ice and sediment cores as well as cave data, we now know that during the Middle Bronze Age, when the Tell settlements were prospering, the climate was fairly warm and dry, providing favorable conditions for crops. But after about 1750 BC, when these settlements slowly began to decline, that same data indicates that the climate began shifting and temperatures decreased while precipitation increased, until about 1500 BC. And then, between about 1500 and about 1300 BC, when the megaforts developed, 
temperatures increased and it became drier. It's not that climate change caused all of this per se, but rather it forms a background to the changes in settlement structure and probably land use. There are problems with this data as of right now. It seems that we know more about climate change in the winter months, for example, but alterations in precipitation patterns over several centuries is thought to have impacted how land was used and organized, and in a period of crisis, it is perhaps not surprising that we see first decline and then a concentration of sites exerting presumed political power over a very changed landscape. So what does this reorganization look like? Well, during the Middle Bronze Age, the Tell settlements appear to have been arranged in a three-tier hierarchy, although that is not necessarily the case across the board. But there's enough evidence of this to suggest that there was a major Tell functioning as the primary settlement and a center of craft production, and this was then associated with smaller Tells as secondary settlements, and lastly there were flat settlements interpreted as farms or other agricultural sites throughout the region. Around 1600 BC, there's a general abandonment horizon in the archaeological stratigraphy, but where archaeologists once thought that this was an abandonment and a decline, it now appears that this was an abandonment and a shift to different sites, the megaforts of the late Carpathian Bronze Age. What's especially interesting about this is that one of the sites that was abandoned during this period is speculated to have been a protostate or something along those lines, based upon similarity in pottery styles and site layout and site size. It's known as the Pechka polity, but like all other Tell settlements, it too was abandoned. So, in more or less all respects, burial rites, material culture, most notably pottery styles, the design of settlements, and presumably the relationship between those settlements, the rise of the megaforts of the late Bronze Age in the Carpathian Basin represent a fundamental rejection of the culture and life ways of the Tell settlements of the Middle Bronze Age. The megaforts were characterized by circular plans, dozens of meters in diameter, and defended by a series of ditches and earthworks constructed by the excavation of those ditches. They're so massive that many of these can still be seen from the air. The construction of these sites would have required Herculean labor efforts, which meant organizing people for such a task, and securing land for the growing of crops to feed all of those people. And this is exactly what we see in the archaeology. The megaforts were surrounded by smaller settlements, very likely within the locus of control of those megaforts. The sites also reveal a lot of weapons and a lot of armor, with new forms of sword being developed during the period, and this very likely indicates warfare and probably the development of territorial thinking on a much grander scale. And, actually, a recent book published in 2022 employs the megaforts to argue that it is here, in the Carpathian Basin, that Europe developed their first kings. But, like the Tell settlements which came before them, the megaforts of the Tisha group did not last. The megaforts were extremely clustered, and due to the rise in inequality and hierarchy which characterized the sites, what seems to have happened is that the subsequent shift in climate patterns after about 1300 BC, this time becoming increasingly arid in the 1200s, affected food production leading to increased competition over increasingly limited resources. What we start seeing in the material record is the abandonment of some of these forts while others have gigantic hordes of broken bronze items and pottery, interpreted as either destruction by a raiding army, or votive offerings to the gods for protection depending on the site in question. There's also a potential shift in subsistence patterns toward pastoralism, probably as a response to declining crop yields and stress placed on communities. Within about a century, most of these sites had declined, and by the 1100s, most of the megaforts had basically disappeared. The other site we're talking about in this video are the ruins of a city dating to the Chinese Neolithic that doesn't appear to be mentioned in any ancient document, and is basically absent from classical Chinese historiography. Recent archaeological surveys of the region, such as the archaeology of East Asia, the rise of civilization in China, Korea, and Japan, published in 2015, don't mention this. This is the archaeological site of Shimao, and it's known colloquially as the City of Severed Heads. 
It is located in the Ordos Loop, a region in Chinese history which has been of immense geopolitical importance because within the Ordos Loop, steppe land gradually transitions to a more agriculturally friendly environment, so it's been fought over by sedentary states in China and nomadic states farther to the north based in the eastern Eurasian steppe. Shimao was, initially, discovered in the 1970s. Locals had been aware of the existence of, well, something in the area, some sort of ancient Chinese ruins, but it was believed that whatever it was, this was simply a piece of some phase of the Great Wall that had been abandoned, forgotten about, and allowed to fall to pieces. In 1976, limited excavations indicated that this was not the case because the outline of some walls and some other aspects of what were very clearly urban planning had been discovered. But, in 2011, this began to change drastically because 120 pieces of jade were found, and jade is not native to the region where Shimao was located, meaning that there must have been some sort of a trade going on whenever the site was occupied. The nearest site for jade is actually several hundred miles away. Since the 2020s, despite a halt due to the recent pandemic, the site has undergone extensive excavations and the picture is drastically starting to change. This is, very easily, one of the most interesting archaeological sites in East Asia. Radiocarbon dating puts the site at approximately 2300 BC, and it became an urban center in the proper sense by about 2000 BC, eventually covering a thousand acres, complete with rings of stone walls. The inner wall being about 4200 meters in total length, and the outer wall being about 5700 meters respectively, and it seems to have come to an end possibly being abandoned sometime around 1700 BC, a period that has evidence of climatic shifts turning to a cooler, drier environment which likely would have impacted agriculture in the immediate area. Thus far, there haven't been discoveries of something like warfare or a sack or anything of that nature, but that could change as excavations at the site continue. So, to put the size of the site in perspective so you get an idea of how big this is, Central Park in New York City is approximately 850 acres in total area. Shimao is approximately 150 acres bigger than that. And while this existed during a period when the preceding Longshan and the succeeding Early Tow cultures both had features of complex urbanization, the Shimao site is highly unusual for the period in that it was largely constructed of stone and dominating the entire site is a step pyramid, approximately 7 meters high, consisting of 20 distinct platforms all reinforced by stone, with at least one structure at the peak being made of rammed earth. The step pyramid of Shimao is absolutely gigantic, with the base being 240,000 square meters in total area. In other words, the base is approximately four times the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, while it's about half as high as that structure, so this thing is simply massive. As if this didn't need to be more impressive, the structure was built on top of a hill, adding to its total height, and ensuring that it could be seen from any point in the surrounding area. The site of Shimao is so striking in the archaeology of China because it would appear that this is where cultural aspects that would later come to characterize Chinese civilization either originated or at least developed here in addition to other areas and were simply lost to the mist of time, including ceremonial bronzes, jade items, and human sacrifice something which would be a major feature of the Shang Dynasty. Indeed, Shimao almost seems to be founded on the premise of human sacrifice as a religious ritual. If that interpretation is correct, then it has a deeper tradition in China than just the Shang. There are six pits located beneath the eastern wall, all of which contain skulls and no other bones of any sort, and then beneath one of the gates in the eastern wall there are two additional pits also containing severed heads. In total, the pits beneath the gate have 48 skulls neatly divided between the two of them, and the six beneath the wall contain a total of 80. And all of these belonged to young women. The overall location is, frankly, rather eerie. As you walk through the gate, stepping over the place where the severed skulls are buried beneath the gate and the wall, you would be confronted by an enormous amount of jade carved in the shape of diamonds embedded in a section of the interior wall, as if thousands of eyes were guarding the eastern gate. 
in addition to the severed heads. Not all of the site has been excavated yet, so it's possible that there will be more severed heads or some other evidence of human sacrifice eventually discovered. So what happened to this mysterious city of ancient East Asia? Well, as of right now, archaeologists are not entirely sure, but as only a fraction of the overall site has been excavated to any meaningful degree, hopefully, one day, that will change. <laughs>